Well, we've got a Triumph 11,000 pound clear floor two post lift. We installed it ourselves and we learned a few things as we did it. So if you wanna learn some of the tips and tricks that we learned while we put in our lift, stick around. Hey guys, I'll tell you right out of the gate, I'm not a professional installer. This was my very first lift install. I'm a do-it-yourselfer. So take my instructions with a grain of salt, read your installation manual, follow those instructions closely, make sure you torque things to spec. Don't take my word for it, but I'm trying to share some things that I feel like I learned when I was installing mine that'll maybe help you out if you're gonna tackle the job yourself. Hope you enjoy. Now, I tell you to use your installation manual and reference it for all of the torque specs and, and assembly instructions. However, when you bring home your lift, it doesn't come with any instructions. I found them online at redlinestands.com. I guess Redline Stands is one of the dealers that sells these Triumph lifts. The place that I went and picked my lift up was National Auto Tools. You know, they import these lifts, so I don't know who's, who's responsible for all of that. But you can find and download the manual at redlinestands.com. I downloaded the manual and printed it out so I could have it out here to reference while I was out here making my installation. Now, if you watched my full install video where I was just kind of, you know, showing time lapse of what was going on, I talked about how everything in this manual is not accurate. The pictures are sometimes of different arms or different uh, locking mechanisms and that sort of thing. So it can be a little bit confusing. So you do have to be careful even referencing the manual, but a little bit of common sense goes a long way. I'm going to start out by talking about making preparations for a lift. You can't just decide you want to lift in your garage if it wasn't built to hold a lift. You need to, at least 12 foot and 2 inches of ceiling height to install a lift. The instructions say um, 145 inches minimum on this. I've got 146 and I feel like it would be nearly impossible to install it even with one inch less than what I had. It was very tough as it was. So 12 foot 4 or 5 would be nice. Um, but it can be done at 12 foot 2. So you need a building that has tall ceilings. Now the next thing you've got to take into consideration is your concrete. The manual says that you need a minimum of 4 inches thickness and 3,000 psi concrete that is reinforced in some way. It could be fiber reinforced, mesh, or rebar. Those are the minimum specs and I would not be comfortable with just that but if you're testing concrete that's already been poured, then one, you need to know if it's reinforced. And two, you need to drill more than four inches deep and make sure you don't go through your slab so that you know that it's thick enough to drill and put your anchors in and all of that. If you have less than four inches of concrete, then it's a no-go. You could cut out a section, you know, three or four foot square and dig down deeper and then pour a, a footer base put rebar connecting the slab to the new footer base that you put in. There are ways that you can make corrections to your concrete in order to uh, withstand a lift. But in our situation, we were pouring fresh concrete out of the gate. So what we did was when we prepped the base, and we've got a video on that, we dug just a little pit uh, out in this area so that we could have seven inches of depth for our concrete. In some places it ended up eight, probably some it ended up six and a half. Uh, we're not the greatest uh, site preppers, but uh, we did make a pit so that it would be plenty deep enough. We laid out chairs and we put rebar and tied all that together. And then we also used fiber reinforcement in our 4,000 PSI concrete. So we tried to go overkill with this. Another way that I went overkill is in the size of lift that I bought. I have a diesel truck. I wanted to be able to lift that very comfortably. So I bought an 11,000 pound lift. The truck doesn't weigh, you know, a lot of people go with a 9,000 pound lift, and the truck doesn't weigh 9,000 pounds. But I don't want to be that close to maxing out the arms and all of the structure of it. I wanted to make sure that I have plenty to where it's safe. So I went, went with the 11,000 pound lift. So you need to make sure that your concrete is smooth and level. You can use some leveling shims underneath the bases of your posts. And we had to do a little bit of that because we finished our own concrete and we're not concrete finishers either. So it wasn't perfect and we had to put some shims in there. You don't want to shim any more than a half an inch in any spot under your base 
of your, uh, your posts. Now, when you're talking about where to place the lift within your garage, that's something that you really want to plan out based on the type of vehicles you're going to be lifting so that you have clearance. You have room to work in front of your vehicle. I wanted room for my toolboxes in front of my vehicle. I wanted to make sure that I could still close my garage door with the vehicle on the lift. Take all those things into consideration as you're laying out your clearances. There is a chart in the installation manual that gives you the measurements for how far apart your posts go, obviously, but also a measurement to the nearest obstruction minimums. So it tells you all those. I'm not going to talk about those specifically, um, but I'm going to tell you how we decided and laid out because we knew that our building was big enough to accommodate the lift and we knew we were putting it in the center bay. So we didn't have any obstructions that were going to cause us clearance issues for the lift. But what we wanted to do is make sure we could lift my quad cab short bed, three quarter ton diesel truck without, you know, hitting either wall and without cramping ourselves in, in terms of space to work on it in front of it. So what we did was we measured from the driver's seat to the tail end of the truck and kind of used that as a guide for uh, where the center, the lift needed to be centered. You position your vehicle basically right around the driver's seat. When you pull in, you pull in with the driver's hips or seat uh, right in line with the posts. So that kind of gives you a, a rough idea of where you want to be parking the vehicle. And so then we measure back to the bumper from there to give ourselves enough room for clearance. And we allowed ourselves a foot and a half behind the truck so that we could walk through there with the truck parked at that position. And as it turned out, that pretty much placed us right dead center of our building. Now, keep in mind that I designed this building around installing a lift and being able to raise that truck. So that's part of why we decided to go 28 foot depth. I originally was planning on building a 24 foot deep building and a couple of friends pointed out that you're gonna want room for toolboxes and stuff in front of the truck. So we went 28 in order to allow ourselves that extra space in front of the truck. So that worked out well. Do your planning according to that to make sure you allow yourself the proper positioning of your vehicle when you're working on it. So you've got your building built, you've got your concrete poured, You've allowed 30 days for your concrete to cure so that you'll be ready to drill and set anchors in it. You wanna make sure that you allow that time to cure because the way your anchors are going to work, they're going to press against that concrete as they pull up. Uh, the expansion might cause your concrete to, to crack and break if it's not cured long enough. So don't get too anxious. Make sure your concrete has had 30 days to cure. Um, they say 28 days. Um, but you want to allow plenty of time for that before you go to install your lift. When you get ready to install, raise up your posts. You do not want to drill your anchor holes until you have your posts in position. So you're going to stand them up first. And what we decided to do is we laid it out on the floor. We drew out lines and we drew squares on the floor where the lift posts would go. Now, there may be a little bit of fluctuation to that based on squaring it, leveling it, and putting your crossbar in. So we stood up one post in the square and we put one anchor in that post to stabilize it. And then we use that as our anchor point and we set the other post accordingly. When you drill, you're going to want to, if you don't have a big Hilti or DeWalt uh, hammer drill, you're gonna to wanna to go rent one. It makes the job a whole lot easier because you've gotta drill a lot of holes that are three quarter inch by at least four inches deep. I drilled my holes four and a half inches deep and you have five and a half inch anchors to drive in. So you wanna make sure that you're set up to do that kind of drilling on your concrete. When you get ready to stand up these posts, I'll be honest, it takes at least two strong men to stand them up if you don't have any equipment. Since I don't have two strong men around here, I have me and my son who's pretty stout, but uh, <laughs> we, we're not big guys. So we got the little Kubota tractor in here and helped us get it up most of the way. And then we tipped them on up ourselves. You can handle it, but you also have to keep in mind that these posts, they may weigh five, six, 700 pounds. I don't know. I know the whole lift combined weighs over, I want to say it was 1700 pounds for everything or 1800 pounds uh, when it's all on the crate ready to roll. Keep that in mind. If it gets away from you, it will crush you. Get out of the way. Once you stand these posts up on that base, even though it's only an 18 inch base, 
they're pretty stable. Ours were not perfectly stable because our concrete wasn't perfectly smooth and level, but they're safe enough that you can walk around them and they're not gonna fall over. When you get to the crossbar installation, I installed the trigger mechanism with the little bar and the wiring on the ground. And then we raised the bar up in the air. And the bar is heavy. That crossbar, I'm sure it weighs 100 pounds. And so you're not going to install it yourself. You need two people. With the tight clearance that we had, we had to stick one end of the crossbar into the post that was anchored already. I had to hold it while my son moved his ladder over here so that he could climb up and hold it in position while I came down and walked the post backwards and tilted it out around the crossbar and then leaned it back into place, which was pretty precarious. We had to do that because of the way it's designed we didn't have enough clearance over the top to go up and over. So if you built it 12 foot six or so, then you'd have room to just take the bar over the top, set it down in there. It would be much easier and much safer. So that's just something to keep in mind while setting your crossbar. Once we had our crossbar in place and bolted in, then we were able to make sure that we squared up the post with one another and drill all of our anchor bolts. Now, we had already measured out and chalked lines on the floor straight across so that we could twist the post within that square and make sure that the posts were squared up with one another. So you need to make sure your posts are square with one another, square with the building, and then plumb so that everything lines up the way that it's supposed to line up. That's gonna be better for your equipment. It's also going to look nicer. One word of advice about your anchors, make sure you follow the specifications that are found in the manual. If you Google it, you're going to get it different answers based on the type of anchor that's provided. If you have wedge anchors provided with your lift, then you don't want to use epoxy when you're setting those anchors. They'll interfere with the way that those anchors are designed to work. Our anchors were five and a half inches long, they were three quarter inch anchors, and they were to be torqued to 90 foot pounds. That's different than most of them that I found, and I'll be honest with you, I started torquing mine to 125 foot-pounds because I had Googled it. Instead of looking at the manual, I saw 125 foot-pounds. But after I torqued one or two of them, and it pulled quite a few threads up out of the concrete to get to that 125-pound torque rate, I got a little bit uncomfortable with how much was left in the concrete. Um, because you know if you pull them up an inch then you're only leaving you know three inches in the concrete and I want as much anchor down in that concrete as I can get so I went back to the manual and checked it out and sure enough our manual says that our anchors are designed to be torqued to 90 foot-pounds so make sure that you follow those specifications and that you check your torque on your anchors regularly after the fact. One small issue that we ran into after we installed our crossbar and we were getting ready to anchor these down was that this post, when the crossbar was slid down in there and the plate was inside it, the, it was wanting to twist this post out of shape. And I think that it's because the top flange on our crossbar was welded on just a little bit crooked. So in order to twist our post square with the other post what we decided to do was get our corner where it needed to be drill and place one anchor and we didn't tighten it all the way down but we placed it to hold the post to keep it from moving around and then we twisted the post into position so that it was square with the other side drilled our next hole and we were able to overcome it that way but it was a little bit of a uh, an issue that we had to figure out as we were installing some of the other little quirks that we ran into while we were installing our lift is for instance our safety switch wire, which is up there. Um, the end on the wire was too big to fit through the hole, that, the pre-drilled hole that they had in the top of the lift. So we had to drill that hole out just a little bit bigger in order to get that end through and over to the post where we need to run it down. Now the next thing that we found is the instructions show a hole somewhere on this post for that wire to come down and come out the hole into the box where it needs to be plugged in but there was there was no hole on our post so we decided the best method to keep it out of the way of the cables and the pulleys and all of that was to drill a hole at the very top right next to the plate where the crossbar mounts so we did that and then we ran it down since we had our wiring running down this post here 
we just zip tied it to that and ran it down and through and into the box. The hydraulic hoses came pre-routed inside the posts, which was nice. All the connections on the tees were made to where all I had to do is run one hose from the bottom of the post from a tee up to my reservoir. And that was very simple to connect. And none of the connections they had pre uh, they had pre-made leaked. So all of that was good and tight. Everything worked great. The only connection I had to make other than that hose was each post had a hose inside it that I had to run up into the crossbar straight above me and they connected in the center of that crossbar. Now that was the next hurdle that we had with building our ceiling so tight to the top of the lift because the crossbar is right up against the ceiling and I had to connect two hoses from that. Now I had enough slack in those hoses, I was able to pull them just outside the crossbar, tighten them up, and then tuck them back inside. But that also created another problem. The fact that there was that much slack allowed that hose to be loose inside the crossbar and could possibly rub up against the cables that are moving back and forth inside that crossbar as you raise and lower a vehicle. Now over time, that cable is going to wear a hole through that hydraulic hose. So what I had to do was I had to drill small holes in that crossbar so that I could run zip ties around my hydraulic hose right down the center so that I could keep it away from those moving cables. Um, that was the solution I came up with because the instructions say to run the hose through the safety clips that hold it in place, but there were no safety clips. There was, there, there was one on each end that you could run it through, but the center was all loose and it was loose enough that it could get against those cables and I wasn't comfortable with that, so I drilled holes and zip tied. Now when it comes to routing these cables, now every lift may not be this way, but they were super simple to route um, in that there is what they were each pre-routed one in each arm and they just go up and over the top drop down into the open hole that's right here and a nut and a jam nut on the bottom of it and then you tighten those until your level so that your safety locks hit at about the same time and your vehicle raises level now one of the things that the instructions said about installing the cable is that you need to remove the pulleys from the lift in order to route the cables and then put them back on and route the cables over it. But that wasn't necessary. There may be different designs or something like that that might require that. But on this lift, you're able to put the cables up and over the top of the pulleys and everything worked just fine. So um, that's just something to be aware of. Now, I mentioned about adjusting these cables and the tension on these cables so that the vehicle raises level. And I did that and I adjusted the cables until the locks clicked at exactly the same time. I watched the video and that's what they were recommending. So that's what I did with no vehicle on the lift. Now what I found is after I put the first vehicle on the lift that I started hearing a little bit of delay from the uh, passenger side to the uh, driver's side. And I was going to make another adjustment on those locks until they clicked at exactly the same time. But I came across a video. That video was put up by Redline Stands and it's just a short video on some installation tips. It was, a, it was a good video. And the one thing that that installer mentioned was that he likes to be able to hear both clicks so that he can be sure that they both engaged. And I thought that was a very good point. And I don't see things being out of level as a vehicle is raising on this lift. It seems to be working well. So I think that I'm going to leave it that way for that very reason. I'll be able to audibly hear each lock click as it raises into position. So I thought that was a good point. I thought I would go ahead and share that. Now installing the actual locking mechanisms is very simple and straightforward. The only difficulty we had is when we were sticking the cable through the uh, bolt. There's a hole in a bolt with a jam nut that closes down on that cable. And we were sticking the cable through that bolt and the cable frayed out and we had to cut it off and start fresh. And that was a little bit difficult, but that small cable just runs up and over through the, the pulleys in the top rail and over to the other side and down, connects to the other side the exact same way. So this process is really simple. Um, there's not really much adjustment involved. You just basically make sure you pull enough tension on that cable when you tighten down your nuts to uh, unlock or disengage both sides as it's coming down. Um, so we have it set up to where basically you push the arm in all the way against the rail and it unlocks both locks. And that's easy enough. Now, in terms of wiring, 
it's a very simple system to wire up. I'm not an electrician, so take that as it is. But you're running uh, 220. Um, the installation manual says you need a 25 amp breaker on that. I ran 10-2 wire in this uh, shielded type of cable because I thought that would be nice to protect it. And I just have a drop. I had wired up a box in my ceiling before I put my insulation up. So I just connected to that, run it down the post here. Now, I wanted an outlet here for my welder and I know that I won't be welding at the same time that the pump is running. So I split that wire and put my outlet in here before I run it on into the box. But very simple connections there. I won't go through that step by step because like I said, I'm not an electrician. If you have a basic understanding of electrical, it's not a difficult install to make. Once you get it all wired up, you've got everything else set up, you need to fill your reservoir with hydraulic fluid. You can run AW32 or AW46 hydraulic fluid in this. Basically just fill up your tank. And what I did to begin the bleeding process was ran the lift all the way up and back down. And then I ended up adding a little more fluid after that once the hoses and everything filled up with fluid. After that, you need to bleed your cylinders and the, the procedures for bleeding the air out of your cylinders is in the ins uh, installation manual. But you raise this halfway up, there's an Allen bolt on top of each cylinder and you just crack that open and you'll hear air start to come out. And I just opened it and let air come out until it stopped and then closed them back up. Now, once you have everything working, you can actually, there's a little bit of adjusting that you can do to the lowering speed of the arms as you release the pressure and allow the cylinders to come back down. One word of advice I would give you is, in the beginning, with no car on it, the arms come down very, very slowly. However, you put a big diesel truck on it and you press this lever with the same setting and it comes down pretty quickly. So, I wouldn't adjust that speed unless you're doing it with a vehicle on it so that you have an idea um, and I'd be very careful doing that because there's, it seems to me there could be some dangers involved in that. But if you go setting these arms to come down fast with no weight on them, I would think that putting a vehicle on it after that, it would come down even faster. So just something to watch out for, but this is the adjustment for that part of it. <laughs> So those are your arm locks and they essentially release on their own when the arms come all the way down to the bottom, then the arms will move freely. So you can just kick them out of the way to get them out from under your car and open up the bay so you can drive through. As you raise the lift up, you saw the locks do automatically engage, but I will warn you, they don't always exactly automatically engage. If those teeth are lined up in just the wrong way, they won't engage correctly. You don't want to trust that, that it's going to lock automatically. When you set your arms in place and then you lift it up, you wanna go around and check each one of those locks and make sure that those teeth are fully engaged and that lock is all the way down because um, I actually had a buddy of mine, Ross on the Land, who mentioned that after my first video to be sure and check those. And sure enough, the very next time that I came out to use the lift, I went to check those locks and I found one of them that wasn't dropped down and that arm was still free. And you don't want that, that could cause some problems. That is the first lock position. When you raise up a vehicle, you never want to raise it to any lower point than your first lock. Don't get under a vehicle unless your arms are sitting on the lock. So if you notice, when you raised it up and the locks have clicked, you still need to release the pressure and allow the arms to come down until they stop on those locks. That way the arms aren't sitting on hydraulic pressure. Now the reason that's important is because if your arms are only sitting on hydraulic pressure, if you have a hose failure, they're going to drop. And you don't wanna be under the vehicle when they drop. That's the same reason why you don't wanna walk under a tractor bucket or a backhoe arm with it raised up in the air because it's sitting on hydraulic pressure. And if a hose busts, it's coming down and it could be devastating. It's meant to be an installation tips video, but the one thing that I'll also mention is they provide you with these adapters, several different sizes of adapters, or some people call them truck adapters, so that you can place them under these arms, under these pads, and level out your vehicle. Because if you've ever noticed, when you look under a truck, the frame is not just straight. It will go up, 
to the cab and back down to the bed of the truck and things like that or maybe the other way around down for the cab to sit in and then up to the bed of the truck so you'll have contours on your frame so sometimes you need the front pad to sit higher off of this arm than the back pad or vice versa and that's to allow for the vehicle to raise level no matter what the contour is up underneath the car from your lifting points now I'm not going to get into lifting points and all of those things because, well, I'm not an expert. This is my first lift and uh, I'm just trying to share a few things that I learned and, and make an interesting video. I know when I was shopping for a lift and I was planning to get ready to make to do installation, um, I kind of wanted to watch some material and get everybody's ideas. And that way I could learn as much as I could before I got into this so I would know what to expect. And so um, I couldn't find everything that I wanted to find so I thought I would make a video just sharing what I learned. But like I said, I am no expert and I don't claim to be, so don't take my word for it. Make sure that you use your own common sense, your own research, and you follow the installation manual closely when you're installing your lift. If you're anything like me, a purchase like this is a huge investment. This, they're not cheap, but hopefully, it, we'll get a lot of good out of it. We'll be able to help people with some of their own uh, vehicle issues and all of that. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting a whole lot of use out of it. Very, very excited to have it, but I wanted to be very careful with it, make sure that I installed it properly. I want to make sure that nobody gets hurt. I don't want to tear up anybody's uh, belongings. I don't want to tear up anybody's car, and I don't want to tear up my lift. So, these are the things that I learned while I was installing the lift. Hopefully they'll be helpful to you. If they're not, pass them on by. If you see any misinformation in this video, you're not going to hurt my feelings by pointing it out because I don't wanna give any bad information on something as important as this. So chime in in the comments. If it's bad enough, I'll edit it out of the video. If it's a matter of opinion, then I'd be glad for you to share it with the audience so that they can have all of the information to make their decisions. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. I hope you find it helpful. I appreciate y'all watching. Y'all have a good day.